Good morning, guys. Welcome to a brand new show, Breaking Through Addiction, with myself, Dr. Rob Kelly, the addiction doctor, and Jennifer Lovely. Hey, Jennifer, how are we doing this morning? I'm so good. How are you? I'm it's all, I'm kind of like, where's Waldo? I'm Now I'm in Sedona, Arizona. So. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> awesome. Absolutely awesome. It's, it's going to be an amazing show. We have an amazing guest yeah. today. But what's the weather like? We have to cover the weather every single time we, we speak. Well, it nice? it's 85 here this morning. It's beautiful. Those red rocks are shining through. Um, hey, you guys, I'm trying to get Dr. Rob to bring uh, Dr. Rob Recovery Group to Sedona, Arizona. I'm trying to say, hey, I think we can do some great healing work there. If I get one text or one email <laughs> saying that, apart from Jennifer, I am going to open an office in, in, in Sedona, without a doubt. So what have you been up to this week, Jen? Anything apart from traveling? Traveling, uh, hiking, spending time with my boys, my granddaughter. It was really, really wonderful. And now I'm here to work and a little bit of play. So Excellent. looking forward to it. Yeah. How about you? I've been, uh, I've just been working a little bit. I'm kind of just taking it easy for now because we're going to, after today, we're going to really get stuck in and, and rebuild the brand again. As you know, I came to San Antonio to retire and it's not been the case. So I think God wants me to take it to another level. And I know me and Jen have got some exciting news for you. We're going to give you a little inside. We're going to be creating something online uh module based which is going to be absolutely awesome we're both excited about it and today just in case you didn't know we've replaced wednesday wisdom with breaking through addiction now this guys that are listening to us and watching us right now this is a private snippet on facebook only that's all we're allowed to do because tonight at seven central it launches and just watch my facebook page we'll tell you where it launches what time how to do it how to click on every week and follow this journey together with us. It is going to be an incredible journey because we're going to go where no other uh, station has gone before, radio show has gone before. And you know me, guys. I, I, I'm the one that curses. I'm the one that finds out what's going on. And Jennifer is like a Rottweiler once she gets her teeth into a little bit. And she'll go after it. So if you want to come on the show, there is a long waiting list, guys. And the sub A list is there that are about to come in as well. So watch this space. And uh, it's going to be amazing. I'm excited, Jen. Are you? I'm super excited. And what I want to just say is that we're all A-listers, Dr. Rob. We're all A-listers. I like that. I like that. <laughs> Guys, we have an amazing guest, John Harrell, who's coming on the show. Stay tuned. We'll be back in about 20 seconds. Morning, guys. Welcome back. Uh, this is Dr. Robbie Addiction Docs. He just joined us. We have an amazing show for you today with my lovely Jennifer Lovely, my co-host. Good morning, Jen. How are you doing? Good morning. How are you? Good morning, John. How are you? I'm well. How are y'all? Good. Oh, fantastic. We're excited to have you on today, John. So glad of you to come and thank you so much. I know there's, uh, there's a few listeners out there that's already know who you are looked at the book, looked at the quotes. So uh, I've got a few texts and, and emails already about you just from putting it on real quick. So Jennifer, why don't you start with John? Yeah, so um, for transparency purposes, um, I know John through my children. And um, so we have kind of a funny story because both of our kids spent some time um, in recovery together. And um, John loves to play jokes on his children. It's actually like one of the things that he lo loves to do. <laughs> and this last April Fools, he called up his son and said, hey, I wanted to let you know, um, Jennifer Lovely and I um, are gonna be getting married. And <laughs> his son calls my son and starts going, Joe, uh, your, mom, my, your mom and my dad are gonna get married. And he was, horrified and my son's like my i guess my son knows his mom too well and he's like do you realize what day it is do you realize what day it is so it's a, we have a funny little story there um but so thanks i just wanted to share that because it's really cute um thanks for coming on i'd love to um dive right in a couple things 
I read your book and um, I read it on an airplane, actually. I love that it's such an easy read. <clears throat> and what I noticed is that you had some major trauma in your life. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> let, let's just go right to it, right? That's like who I am. Um, and, but it's interesting because the thing that brought you to recovery or Al-Anon was actually um, a family member. And so why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got into the recovery or Al-Anon? Sure. So it was about 10 years ago. It was November of 2010. And I literally crawled into an Al-Anon meeting. I mean, I always kind of joke and say, well, nobody goes to an Al-Anon meeting because their life is going swimmingly well, right? <laughs> <laughs> and as it turns out, which I learned later, I was suffering from PTSD at the time, which I always thought PTSD was bullshit until I got it. You go, no, this stuff's real. You're like a walking zombie. And and it's thank God I were, was able to find the right people I was led to to help me. But, you know, I did the typical thing. I looked at al -Anon meetings all around. I'm in Austin, Texas, I looked around all, all around Central Texas, thinking I'll go up to Georgetown or go to. San Marcos, which are about 30 minutes away, because I won't see anybody I know, right? And and finally, just common sense kicks in and go, well, you're an idiot. If you see somebody there that you know, they are there for the same reason you are. So get rid of the shame as best as you can. But you go into, I went into Al-Anon, like I say, on my knees. I was a shell of a man at the time, not fully living, just sort of existing. And if you know me, you know, I've got this vibrant personality. I'm outgoing. I'm sociable. I am, I've never met a stranger. And I, that was not how I was living at the time. So I go walking in and I, I find a meeting that was close. And God led me to the right meeting because I resisted going. But I was set It's at a, at a family weekend thing. My ex, she was in a recovery center. And this guy that was leading the family weekend said, you need to get an Al Anon. I go, nah, it's not for me, man. He goes, he goes, no, no, you need to just try it. Just try it. Okay. Which was interesting because you're you're taught in Al Anon and through life, don't tell somebody what to do. But I'm glad he did because it got me to consider it, right? So then um, I find this meeting and I it's about five minutes till eight at night, and it's dimly lit, small room. And I go walking in and I'm standing at the doorway looking around. And I go, okay, there's about five people in here. And I don't really look at anybody's face or anything. I just go sit, sit down. And I never wear ball caps. I had a cap on, had a jacket on because it was late November. And I kind of slumped down in the, in the seat. And immediately this voice sitting right across from me goes, John. Oh, shit. <laughs> Jim, how are you? You know, and he goes, good, buddy. He goes, good to see you here. And I go, well, thanks. And I was confused because I knew my friend Jim was an AA guy. And so I said, am I in the right, am I, what meeting am I in? He, he said, are you looking for al -Anon? I go, yes. He said, that's here. And he goes, see, I was confused. He says, uh, we'll talk afterwards. And I go, okay. And, and I love this guy. He, it, what happened was with Jim, he and I were acquaintances and we'd see each other a couple of times a year, have lunch, surface conversation. And it, that opened up a deeper, more meaningful friendship. And he's just one of the solid guys in my life and a, and a wonderful man. Um, <clears throat> but I sat in the meeting and he actually took it upon himself to lead it. And he said, I, uh, it's an ACOA meeting. He said, I wanted to, to lead this meeting because um, my friend is here and I want him to have an experience that was memorable for him. So it's, I'm paraphrasing. But he also read The Newcomer's Welcome and I remember about the third line it says, you may think you're here to stop your loved one from drinking, but that's not what this is about. And I'm going, ah, shit, again, <laughs> you know? I mean, I just go, I go from being really down to further down. I'm going, how much farther can I go? Well, I was about to find out. But after that meeting, I can't explain it. It's just a, a, a feeling, it's a sense. It's a, there's no question that there's more spirituality in an Al-Anon meeting than in many churches on the weekend. It's just, it's so special, but I felt better and I couldn't explain it, but I realized I don't need to explain it. I, I had an hour of peace that I treasured and I enjoyed it so much. I went back every single night for 15 months. I didn't miss a night. I, I was the Rottweiler of al right? I didn't miss Thanksgiving night. I didn't miss Christmas Eve, Christmas night. I mean, we'd have celebration. I'd go there 
and it was just an hour of peace. My ex used to call it a cult, which kind of kept get, you know, is you're getting a little bit of, of pushback there, but I guess maybe she saw it as a threat or something. I, 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 that's the only thing I can, I can see, but I learned so much. And again, I would get an hour of peace. Some people would come in that were pretty much regulars and, and not, not as regular as me, but they come in and, and they would start <laughs> sharing something and I would just have to tune them out because I'm not getting it. But I thought, you know what? It doesn't matter whether I get it or not, because it's for them. This is their program. And if they're getting something from saying what they're saying, more power to them. I'm going to give them the respect that they deserve and, and I can tune it out. And then when they quit, I can, we, I can listen to the next person. So it, it was just, I don't go to Al-Anon any, anymore unless I'm, when I seem to be led to people that have addicted kids or something, or they're living with an addict and I will take them because again, you don't go to Al-Anon because your life is going perfectly or going well. You go because you're in a real shit storm and, and you're, you know, you're at the end of your rope and you, that's the knot that you tie on to hang. So, uh, but I will take them so that they are not afraid. They have somebody, some familiarity there. And I just say, look, you know where to go. This is a meeting that I really turned on to. And if, um, if, if you get value here, go back. And if you don't, that's your choice. Or maybe, maybe try another meeting, but, but I will be glad to introduce you. And if people go or don't go after that, I never ask because it's not my business. It's not my program. It's their program. So I'm grateful for Al-Anon for a lot of reasons. When, when I was making notes about this today, I, was, I started writing out Al-Anon and all the things I learned from it. And you know, I, got a, I got a page, <laughs> you know, and I, I stopped because I needed to stop. But, but um, a lot of great <laughs> lessons there, which have helped me and come back to me um, many, many times over, almost, almost daily, almost daily. So tell, tell me what uh, a specific incident, or was there several? I think I know the answer to this, but I want to lead into it of of the PTSD because I know when same as you, I suffer from PTSD, and when it was put to me, um, I, I didn't believe in it. I didn't think it happened. Now my PTSD went back to childhood. Now I know something happened in your life that must have caused this PTSD. Just just share with the with the viewers exactly what was going on there. Sure. So I grew up in a in a walking on eggshells, fear-filled in, in home life, right? My dad was a, you know, sad because there was good in him, which I saw. I'm a good finder. I see the good in people and situations quickly. But he was probably a dry drunk. Um, he only drank two days, two day, um, two times a year, Christmas and Thanksgiving. And he'd have one drink and he'd measure out one jigger of alcohol. And my, my dad would kind of calm down and be nice. So I'd encourage him to drink more, you know, but he got, no, 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 that's it. That's all. So, uh, cause all I wanted was peace in our, in our home. I wanted it to be like the, I thought, I thought family life on TV was what family life was like. I didn't realize that, you know, <laughs> what, what a normal family does look like, which is not that either. But so I had a traumatic event, which occurred in August of 2010. And to save time on the store, let's just say it is what caused my limbic system and my frontal cortex to stop talking. And over the course of a few months is when it really started setting in. And I'm like, something's wrong with me. Something is drastically wrong with me. And um, I, I mentioned that my ex was in um, a treatment center at the time. And so her psychotherapist at the center said, your husband needs to need some help. He, and I never met the lady. She said she he needs someone to talk to, someone to guide him. And she, she said, it can't be me. But let me give you a name. Give me the name of a guy named David Clemens here in town. And I picked up the phone, called. He called me back. We had a few minutes on the phone. He goes, I'm going to send you a questionnaire and um, then we'll get together. David is one of, is the wisest man and kindest man I think I've ever known. So I go meet with him. And there's nothing magical about this meeting. You got to remember, I'm a walking zombie at this point. There's nothing like, oh, he's my guy. But, but um, I thought, you know what? I had one sole criterion, and that was, if he says, how does that make you feel? I go, you're a quack. But he never said that. He just sat and we talked, and he listened. And he didn't ask me to make the next appointment. I said, well, I'd like to see you again. He goes, okay. So I made an appointment for the next week. And after three or four sessions with David, um, 
I, and I put David's name in my book. I'm real open about, about psychotherapy because I think that everybody has got some things that they can go through and work. Through. It's got to be the right person. Maybe David's not their person, but somebody, somebody out there is out there for you. And about three or four sessions in, he goes, John, I have a suspicion that you're suffering from PTSD. Here's what PTSD is. And here's how I here's what I use to, to, to treat it. And it's eye movement desensitization repositioning, EMDR, founded in 1992 by Francine Shapiro on the West Coast. And he explained it to me. I said, I'm game. I've got, I've got to do something. And so we did one session of EMDR. He said, it may take more than one, but sometimes we have success with one. And he also explained that the results aren't going to be immediate. It's kind of like, you know, it's kind of like rebooting your brain. And it was because over the next couple of weeks, I started feeling again. I started smiling again. I started laughing. Uh, my, my, all my senses were coming back full on. I'm like, I'm great. But I kept seeing David. And I, and I, I still see him. I only see him about two or three times a year now just to check in. And we're going to sit down and, and we sit there and we laugh in that hour of, of time together. I'm going, this isn't what psychotherapy is supposed to be like, David. I'm supposed to be in here with tissues and crying and we're telling you all about all the demons I'm battling right now. But and he goes, he goes well, psychotherapy is whatever you need it to be. Okay. But um, I remember about two and a half years into therapy with David. I said to him, I said, dude, you have never said to me, I think you need three years of therapy. I need to see you once a week, once every two weeks. What gives? He said, John, I believe that God sends me the people who need to see me when they need to see me. He's always full. He truly has, and he's not a Christian counselor per se, but he truly has a faith-based business model that works. He is doing, as I've told him many times, is you're doing what God intends you to do on planet Earth because he's that good. He's a, he's a side dot D, so he's a, you know, he's a doctor, but he's a, of a, of a uh, psycho counseling, if you, if you will. But that was my experience with it. So I don't blow off um, PTSD anymore as I, as I used to think, eh, you know, get over it, man up, throw, you know, <laughs> throw some dirt on it, as the coach used to say, get up, you know, and, 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 and get after it. It's, you know, there's real trauma that goes on in here, but there's healing from that trauma. Um, John, can I interrupt? Um, so I, I know for me, I had CPTSD um, from my trauma in my uh, childhood. And it usually, you know, takes an event for later on in life for it to really come out and really begin to affect us. That's why a lot of times you'll see like alcoholics become alcoholics later on in life, right? There's usually an event that brings up the the addiction. Um, so I know that your dad was an incredibly abusive human being. And I also know that you wrote a book called Killing My, Killing My Father and Finding Him, yes. correct? My mom wasn't much better, by the way. I, I didn't get a, um, nurturing from either parent. But yeah. and I always say, don't feel sorry for me because it's all been forgiven. Yeah. Everything's fine. So anyway, go ahead. Yeah. So, I mean, I love that you are so forgiving of these two people that were so abusive to you. Um, and I'm really curious, like, what was, what was the point? Was it taking your father dying for you to forgive him? No. What caused it, and, I, and, and my parents were both deceased. My dad died in 1982, my mom in 1997. And I didn't really have a relationship with them per se. I mean, after I got out of high school and went to college, I never went back home. I just, you know, I would call every now and then and, and all, but there was no relationship there because it just, they weren't capable of having one with me and I wasn't capable of having one with them and didn't want to have, because it's like, I don't turn on to people telling me I'm not worth a damn, you know, which is what I got and I would never amount to anything. So the way that it works is this, and I'm grateful because I get to speak to young people several times per year and, you know, kids in detention, kids are in lockdown, kids in church camps, et cetera. And I tell them, look, gratitude is the key. When you actively practice gratitude, you take time during your day, write down what you're grateful for or just meditate on it. Um, gratitude changes the biochemistry of your brain in a good way. And it allowed me 
to see the world and see other people through a completely different prism. And that prism is I was able to see with my parents, I was able to see them for who they truly were, faults and all. Um, and I was able to forgive them for their inability to be a good parent to me. Um, I, I, I truly was able to let it go and forgive them, which released a lot of demons in my soul that, that needed to go. But gratitude was the key because um, it does change your brain. And I've always been a positive, inspired kind of guy. But being grateful and next, and I talk to these kids, these these kids in lockdown. I go, I get it. You can't get up and walk outside when you want to because your day is controlled. But but take something small, like take a deep breath, fresh air. It's not toxic to your system. It doesn't set your lungs on fire. It's free. It's plentiful, and we take it for granted. Mm-hmm. Not if you're a baby in Syria who's your, your leader has gas bombed you, and every breath you take sets your lungs on fire. And there's a water fountain in the room. So you can go over that water fountain. You can get you can get fresh water. It's not going to poison you. Not so in Flint, Michigan, right here in the United States of America. The water has so much mercury in it. It's toxic. It's killed children right here in the United States from drinking water. So when you start thinking about these things, you'll find more and more things. And your entire life changes when you actively practice gratitude. So that yeah, was what gratitude. allowed me to forgive them. For, did I want a good family? Did I want to be from a family? And I, I see families that get together over holidays and stuff and go, yeah, I wanted that. That's all I ever, that's all I really ever wanted as a child. But I wasn't given that opportunity. Now, fast forward. Here's a here's gratitude manifested for you. Had I not had that background, I would not be relatable to kids that are 13, 14, 15 years old who are in lockdown because they've done some really bad things. I know that out of a hundred kids, most of those kids come from really screwed up backgrounds, but bad family lives and they're acting out. But I'm able to, as I share my story with them, I'm able, I'm, I'm relatable. Within two to three minutes, all the skin color difference, all the age difference, it all just goes away. It all melts away and they see me as one of them. And I talk to these kids about stuff that is going on in their lives. I was like, you know, suicide. Youth suicide became the number two killer of kids in 2016. I talked to them about that. I said, I know in a crowd this size, someone has given up. Someone's given up hope. Someone is ready to pull the trigger. You're done. And once you get out of here, that's it. And I've had kids walk up to me after I, I talk. They always come up and say something. Many do. I had a kid, you know, just a couple of years ago, walk up and say, because I've got to tell you that I was the kid that you were talking about because I was going to off myself when I got out of here. And I, 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 and I said, thank you for telling me that and sharing that with me. I said, what's your name? He said, it's Edwin. And I shook hands with him. I go, Edwin, I love that name. I'm a John. There's lots of Johns around, but there's very few Edwins. And his eyes, his smile just lit up the room. And I was like, what a great kid. Fast forward six months, I, I went back to the same facility and I'm giving him a talk. And I'm standing at the back afterwards. And there are three or four, four young, young women, young girls in there. And I was talking to them and, and just kind of making them laugh and all. And I see this guy come walking my way, his head's down, and he sticks his hand out and shakes hands with me. And he goes, thank you for coming back. And, uh, and I go, Edwin? He looked up, he smiled, and he had that great smile. And he goes, you remember me? I said, of course, I can't forget you. I'm glad you're here. And he just nodded and, and, and walked away. So I wouldn't be able to experience that kind of joy without having my background. If I just went in there as some business guy who had a normal normal family background and talked to him about how to build a successful business, you need to go to college, all this other stuff, they're not going to relate to that. But they can relate to a violent home. My dad put me in the hospital twice by the time I was two years old. I start with that. And it just goes, I start telling stories about how I acted as a child, trying to get acceptance, trying to be validated when you know my feelings weren't validated. If I had spilled water on the floor, I would get a whipping and be told I was worthless. I mean, it's, it's that, it was that crazy, right? Well, I, think it, I think it has to be. I think it has to be when, when, when anybody is, is passing down or anybody is teaching, when it comes to the, 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 the area that we're all in and we're all talking about now, not talking about normal teaching. If you've been there and had the experience, whether you're 15 years old or 50 years old, you can tell if that guy's talking from experience. And I know for me, when I'm working with somebody who's become homeless, 
or as a high bottom or whatever it may be, they can tell that you've been there. And I know when people speak to Jen, it's the same thing, when she talks about kids and talks about the stuff that she went through. And I think it's very important that we have the experience. We have more effect on people in five minutes than, than normal counsellors. No disrespect to normal counsellors, but this is a niche, uh, niche area I'm talking about, than counsellors do in two or three years. Because once you can relate, you can start to let go. There's nothing better because it's all about mirroring with anybody you want to get to know. So if you have the experience that they've had, the violent in the home and stuff like that, automatically that there's a connection and you can build on that. Talk to me about your blog that you do every morning. Why do you do it? And uh, what's, what was the idea behind it? So um, I never was a writer. And the reason is I hated, I hated English so much. I didn't even take it in college. True story. I went to a private college. You didn't have to take that stuff. I'm like, I'm not taking English. I no way. Fast forward to 2015, and I was sitting with a friend of mine. And I'm just, I'm a storyteller, as you can probably tell. And, and I'm telling them stories. And he's, this has been going on. We go, to, we go to, to lunch every Sunday after church. And so I have to tell them stories and stuff. And he goes, you got to write this stuff down. You got to journal this. I go, dude, I am not a writer. Okay, I tried journaling years ago and and i just have a blank page i had nothing came he goes no no you've really got to write these things down Nah, it's not for me so then he buys me a journal and he goes here i bought this for you and i said a prayer over it. so like now i'm guilt tripped into writing something so i opened it you know a few days later i opened it and just started writing and it really was just flowing it's not like long diatribes you know i don't it's i don't write missives i just write inspirations if something pops in my head no matter how good it may be i write it down immediately because i won't remember it later i've gotten up out of bed i've gotten out of the shower i've pulled off in traffic to write something down and so i kept thinking i was driving this was that was april of 2015 in october of 2015 7 20 in the morning i'm driving down second street going to my parking garage out of nowhere comes this thought you need to write a blog huh <laughs> I was thinking about my work day and going in and preparing and what I had to do that day and all. I'm like, where did that come from? And it's just, it was clear, very clear to me. It's like, you need to write a blog. Okay. So December 31st of 2015, I was in Las Vegas, sitting 20 floors above the strip. I thought, you know, one of my goals for 2016 is to write a blog. And, and I was like, you know what, why wait, just do it now. So I went and opened up a WordPress site and got a name and, and all, and I wrote a blog and published it. And it was horrible, <laughs> absolutely horrible. I even had a misspelled word in there, which is like, you know, you just don't do that, right? Cause you look like the, the hack that you are. And so I went, but I, luckily with WordPress, you can correct it. So I went back and corrected it. And um, I, I would write something about every three weeks and put it out. And then, um, I wrote a blog and this, I'm going to, I'm going to come back to the, to, to the daily thing here in a minute, but I wrote a blog in April of 2018. I called it, I the titled it Atticus Finch is dead. Atticus Finch, the fictional character from my favorite book and movie to kill a mockingbird um, was, I read that book at the right moment in my life because I needed a male role model. I needed someone to look up to. I was probably 12 years old. Now I knew, I was bright enough to know that Atticus was a fictional character, but he had to be based on someone. Turns out he was based upon Harper Lee, her, her the author, her father. And it's the most beautiful story. But 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 I, the, in that in that blog, I wrote about. Um, I, I cited a Department of Justice study which said 69% of youth suicides are kids from fatherless homes. 92% of homeless are kids from fatherless homes. 75% of rapists are kids from fatherless homes. In the next paragraph, I put, but what about those of us whose dad came home every night, but we really wished he didn't? Because I'd gone into, like, I'd kind of touched the surface of what my family life was like. And I went into a deeper dive there about what my dad was like and what it was when he came home and how <clears throat> wonderful I was of him. And my mom played off that. And, and I, was, I was able to keep it short, but but I received hundreds of messages from people, text, email, got a phone call from someone I went to middle school with. And they, the, 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 the theme was, they all said, I grew up the same way, but I thought I was the only one. 
And nobody knew knew that about me because when I was in high school, I was an athlete. I was a thespian. I sang in the choir. You know, football players don't sing in the choir, but I didn't give a shit. I like singing, so I would do that. But nobody knew any of this about me because, you know, when you're a high school kid, you got to put on that air of confidence and everything's cool and all this. But it, I started thinking, maybe I just need to write my story. Maybe it can do some good. Um, I didn't write it for fortune and fame. Didn't get either one of those. But I thought I, I can make an impact on people. I can help people. I can reach others and it can leave a positive impact on their life. And, and so I wrote it. True story. I scheduled a group, a bunch of TV interviews for around the country to talk about a book I hadn't even written yet. And I had three weeks to get that mother out and then get it and then published before I went, went on there. And I got it, I got it done, got it accomplished, got it published. And I'm grateful to say it hit bestseller, number one bestseller first day. And I'm happy for that. But, but more importantly, I got an email from a guy and I've gotten lots of emails, but one I got is just stuck with me from a man named Tom. I have no idea how he found me. He found the book, but the email's in the back of the book. And he said, I, I got to tell you, your book was the catalyst which inspired me to get help for PTSD, which I've suffered from for 63 years. Mm. 63 years. And he sent me his story, and I had to stop reading it because it got to be so gross. But this poor man, his mother, his mother sexually abused him from the time he was four years old on. And he's been living with this for 63 years. So I still check in with him. I go, hey, how's it going? And he said, every Monday, I talk myself out of going to therapy, but I go. And I'm getting better. So yeah. I'm grateful for that. And I love that because the thing, I mean, ultimately, that's what the, you know, our experience, hope and strength in recovery is doing for people. Um, I know that you have, you do a daily vlog. Mm -hmm. Um as well as encouragement for all. Um, what I am curious about is what would you tell young men that are, or what do you, or what do you want to tell young men that are struggling, whose fathers or family members are abusive, or maybe even they're being bullied? bullied? Sure. Well, what, can you give me like three things that you can share with them? Sure. So first of all, men need to be men. You know, men have been turned into these, you know, quasi men. And if you look at any TV show, and I don't really watch much TV, but if you but if you watch any any show at all, whether it's a cartoon from The Simpsons to Seinfeld to you know whatever, the men are always bumbling idiots. The women are strong. And that's the role that women have 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 taken. Seven out of ten black kids are born into homes without a father. Seven out of ten. And that's also the fastest growing dynamic among whites and Mexican families. And it's just like, it blows my mind. But so young men don't know how to be men. In fact, they start thinking, well, um, ma a man need, means it's my way or the highway. You know, I'm the one that makes all the decisions. Well, that's kind of misguided because men and women both bring something really good to the table. We see things differently. You know, women, I would, women notice everything about you, right? Women notice everything. <laughs> Whereas a man can barely get the trash out on time, then wants to be congratulated for it, right? But because there's so many single women, so many divorces, so many women who are raising kids on their own while dads are out being Disney dad or whatever, and that's not all cases, but that's that's overwhelmingly the majority. Women have been put into position where they have to be both. What do I say to young men? Be a man, find a role model, find somebody that you can look up to that exemplifies what being a man is. Because a man is supposed to be the leader of the family. The man is supposed to be the spiritual leader. When you look back to the Garden of Eden, after Eve ate the apple, gave it to Adam, God comes looking for them, and they were hiding. Well, he knew where they were, but, you know, and, and, and so, but who did, who did God talk to? He talked to Adam. And what did Adam do? She made me, she gave it to me. She gave me the apple. Like, no, accept the responsibility because you're responsible to be the spiritual leader of your family, whatever that looks like. If you don't know how to do it, ask someone who you believe is a good example. When I became a dad, and I wrote about this in the book, I didn't know how to be a dad. I did not, I knew, I knew what I didn't want to look like. So I thought, you know what, I'm a reader. I can read, I can learn. 
but then I can also talk to men that I know who I think are good fathers, their kids are good kids, and say, you know, when you get in this situation with your kids, do this. What do you do? And, and, and listen, actively listen to what they say, and then take into account how it fits my personality, my style of, of interacting and, 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 and exchange with, with my sons. And, you know, I'm grateful. I, you know, my, I have two boys are the reason I have gray hair. I'm just glad I still have it. But the, uh, my, t- my sons have grown up to be young men of good character, the solid character. And that's all I ever wanted. I said, I don't care what you do in your life, but whatever it is, do it well. But have good character. Make sure that your word is your bond. You tell the truth. You, you know, I, I hate this. I hate the saying, fake it till you make it. You face it until you make it, whatever it is. And oh so gosh. I'm grateful they both, they both turned out that way. I started writing the blog daily. Let me get back to that real quick. Again, I ha- had a voice tell me in June or May or June of last year, saying, you need to make this a daily inspiration. I, go, I don't want to write every day. You know, it's, it's a stretch for me to write something every three weeks. But on June 9th, I turned it into a daily inspiration. And I keep it short. It's anywhere from three to 30 words. Once a week, I post the inspirational videos I make. I put those on you know, Facebook, Instagram, uh, WordPress, Twitter, and probably a few other places I can't think of, but they're always under a minute. This one last week was 32 seconds about, um, I won't tell you what it's about, but, but, but get the one, the one thing I said, get the worst four letter word in the English language out of your, out of your mindset. And that word is can't get that word out of your mindset because that word will stop you from doing anything, great or otherwise, great or mediocre. It will keep you from doing things and taking chances. So I have not missed a day. I write something unique every day. And sometimes I repeat things because there's common themes about gratitude, about getting rid of judgment, about believing in yourself, finding confidence, reaching and impacting others. There's common themes there. And I um, have developed a decent following, I guess. But I get a lot of comments back and... And all, and I'm, and I'm pleased, and I'm pleased. And I, I, I started recording the videos, and I can't tell you why. I, I just did. I, I always liked that. I like public speaking. I like interviews like this, obviously. But I started doing it. I thought, why am I doing these videos every week? I've been doing it for about a year and a half. I go, what, what impact am I making? And they're getting anywhere from 1,500 to 4,000 views a week from all sources. And every time I start thinking about not doing it, Every time someone texts me, someone calls, go, man, you gave me the exact message I needed right when I need right today is exactly what I needed to hear. All right. I'm going to keep going. It's amazing how that happens. It's amazing how whenever you say something, somebody always needs to hear it. I know it's many, many times. John, we're coming to the end. Where can we find you, John? Where can people find you? You can find me on Facebook just under John Harrell in Austin, Texas. You can find my blog at www.seeking-grace.com. You must put that little dash in there, seeking-grace.com. Uh, you can find my author page. It's johnharrellauthor.com, two R's, two L's. And all, every blog is automatically downloaded there. Um, you'll see some interviews I did around the country, and, and you'll see some stuff about Rachel's Challenge, which is a, a board I'm privileged to serve on um, for five years now. It's great. Excellent stuff. I want to thank you so much, John, for coming on. I know it's been awesome. I've got a few texts already saying how amazing you are. So thank you for your time. Thank you for coming on. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep banging them blogs out and leave it to Jennifer to say goodbye to you. John, thank you as always. It's always good to see you first thing in the morning on Wednesday. (laughs) Thank you. Women rarely say that to me. (laughs) Um. And I just really want to acknowledge you for not only your presence, but who you are in the world for these young men and women, um, and also who you are for all of us in encouragement for all, for seeking grace. I love that you and I both are some way, somehow seeking grace. I think we ultimately are seeking grace. And I want to just acknowledge you for your grace and who you are in the world, and um, not only for your children, uh, but all humans and humanity. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you all both for, for uh, giving me this opportunity to, to come out and share with you and your audience today. I really do. I really do appreciate it. And I am grateful for both of you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, John. Guys, me and Jennifer will be back shortly. Stay with us. But for now, John Harrell, thank you so much indeed.
Hey guys, welcome back. It's John Harrell. Absolutely amazing. The stuff he does and uh, the stuff he's been through. We did touch on a lot of stuff that if you actually Google him, you'll see some stuff on there that might surprise you. What a great guest, Jen. Yeah, you know, I, I like, I'm, I'm always, I'm, I don't know why I'm amazed, but I'm always amazed that, um, we have these events in our life and they're usually outside of ourselves. Sometimes they're ourselves, but that bring us back to the events. Oh, you always, what do you say? Let's go back to the scene of the crime, yes. right? It ultimately yes. brings us back to the scene of the crime. So we are going to have to actually do the work around the scene of the crime in order to be able to really move forward in our life and really heal. And what a lot of people, well, I know my mom and dad did, I don't know about yours, but it was all swept under the carpet. You know, it mustn't leave the house. You know, you must not say this. And I find that that sweeping under the carpet in the years, I'd say from about five years ago to today and continuing, it's starting to show. It's coming up and we can't do that. We can't, it's, it's going to come back and it's going to bite us on the ass no matter what happens. And unless we go back and clear it up, we're never going to get well. And I truly believe no matter what we're suffering from, we're not talking about alcohol and drugs or, or sex or food. I mean, it's just it's just trauma in general that we're not going to clear that up until we go back. And I, I must admit, the first five years of my program, we didn't do that. We didn't go back, and, and people were relapsing. And wow. it was only yeah, it was only the evidence that look, you know, we had a psychotherapist come along. Um, God bless her. We don't see her anymore, but she came along and she told us what. And so we implemented it, and wow, what a difference! Yeah, I know, like. <clears throat> just allowing the parts of ourselves to um, that are younger to have a voice and actually begin to share how they felt during that time and what what do they need right now? Like, because when we have re so I love to say that when it is um, his when it's historical, it's hysterical. So when you're having that moment of hysterical, right? It's usually historical. We must go back to give voice to that part of ourselves that was really, really hurting. And what um, and what I love, and that's usually the PTSD, right? That's usually the thing that needs to come up. Yeah, every time. I mean, it's amazing how we're finding people. We only thought years ago that PTSD was for people like in the army or someone who's been in a terrible car crash or yeah. something horrific, horrific offense. And what we're finding is the childhood. Uh, trauma is absolutely phenomenal because as we say here anything less than nurturing is child abuse because we'll grow up with that stuff and i'm not saying everyone should grow up like the, like the waltons you know but i'm saying we have to be careful what we're teaching and what we're showing our kids because the percentages that john just came up with at 97 percent of people without a father going to do this 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 i have no doubt that they are correct because that's what we're seeing now and we really have to look at parents of, of what our role is in our children's future. It's not just a, a case of, of, you know, raising them and hopefully they'll go to college. I mean, it goes much more than that. I truly believe that if, if a kid goes to college and succeeds, and doesn't have to go to college, but succeeds in life, a lot of that's come from the parents. Oh, for sure. I mean, it's all about these experiences. It's funny. Um, I went to France back in October and I have all these particular ways that I eat my food, right? And and the ladies that I was with go, you know, Jen, it's so weird how, you know, you're, the food and it has to be a certain way. And they're like, something must have happened to you. Right. And I go, oh, yeah. Well, when I was when I had to go live with my um, dad and my stepmom, I, I mean, I was like my stepmom would cook me dinner and I'd I mean, breakfast and I'd have to sit at this bar and eat these eggs. And the eggs were runny and the milk was warm and I would have, I was forced to have to eat it and drink it. And so this day my eggs cannot be runny and I can't drink milk, right? So it's funny, those just small little things like that can make a big difference in a child's life. You know, we yeah. need to be curious with the child and go, hmm, what's going on? Why are you not eating? It's And it's okay if you don't like it, it's not personal, you know? Yeah, without a doubt, guys. Yeah. Uh, we're going live tonight, uh, or we're going out on the air tonight, around 7 p.m. Central. Um, just for this week, um, it will, we'll obviously broadcast it on Facebook. We'll have all the websites next week, so you can uh, jump on around 7 if you don't if you don't want to uh, watch it right now or you want to file it somewhere. But Facebook, our followers, 
myself and Jen and anybody else that's following us will always get the preview because you're our Wednesday Wisdom first of the show that's going out on 50 platforms and internet radio. So before anybody else sees it, you guys are going to see it first. So I hope you'll join us next week. Same time, same place. And if you're free tonight, you'll see it on our Facebook. Go on again and get another watch. And for me, I'll say bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. I know both Dr. Rob and I are just grateful for your feedback, um, for the love. And we're striving to really make a difference um, in addiction and all parts of addiction, not just drugs, alcohol, but all parts of addiction. And even if you're just struggling, even if life seems really difficult for you now, we really, really are here to make a difference in your life. And I believe that that's why both of us were put on this earth. So thank you so much. So much love to you. And, and we're don't forget, guys, uh, Dr. Rob Kelly on uh, Facebook, Jennifer Lovely on Facebook, robkelly.com, jenniferlovelycoaching.com. You can find it all on there, guys. And we will see you next week.